Hey beer geeks! Now I'm sure you've all been counting, but it still might be hard to believe that I have now done 10 blind taste tests on this channel. That is 155 different beers tasted blind. And that goes across everything from bitter to supermarket IPAs, Christmas beers, no and low alcohols, fest beers, bad macro lager, good macro lager, regional American macro lager, and most recently, Nitro stouts, that's, um, you'd, you'd think I'd learn nothing from, <laughs> from these tastings from that bore. But I am here today to talk through the things that I've learned during this incredible experience while tasting those incredible beers, and indeed, what I've learned from the comments. So I've fixed the pour and I thought that I'd start by going through some of the numbers that tie together this incredible and indeed often quite dispiriting uh, odyssey that I've been on with all of these beers. So let's dig in to some of the numbers. So the first thing I did when I dug back in, other than just question some life choices, um, is to look at the average score. So across all 10 of these tastings, the average score was 18.1. As I said throughout this series, I regard 20 is the kind of pint that I would go back to the bar for a second of, so 20 out of 30. Nowhere near, nowhere near half of those, those beers that I tried hit that mark, which is a little bit, uh, a little bit distressing. Um, along the way though, we did have some serious, serious highs and some serious surprises as well. This is one of them alongside, so it drew with London Black, which I thought was my favorite sort of nitro dark beer. Uh, actually the highest score beer came from the supermarkets and we'll dig into that in a bit, but that was Love and Hate from Vocation, which scored, uh, scored 25, got peachy, coconut, thick with three C's, clean and citric. The lowest score actually went uh, to Miller Lite, which in retrospect, we'll dig into this as well, seems pretty surprising. Like I remember, there's beers that I remember more for being terrible than Miller Lite, uh, but that scored a lowly seven. Uh, but there was a beer that got eight, actually in the supermarket uh, one, it was Tooth and Claw Cat Amongst, which scored eight. And I can still kind of taste that in my nightmares. Uh, yikes. Oh my God. There's a really terrible, terrible beer that had just about every single floor um, that a beer could have. And that really low score for Miller Lite kind of leads me into my first takeaway from this, which is probably one of the biggest things I've learned in beer, or most significant, or most surprising thing, in fact, all of these things, since I got into beer 13, 14 years ago. And that is that despite all the claims, all the cliches that, you know, we should respect macro brewers for being able to produce consistent beer, that all macro beer is the same, that it's all boring, watered down nonsense, None of that is really true. In fact, there's quite a lot of diversity in macro beer. So the first thing I've learned is that macro beers are not all born equal. You can see uh, in the tastings that I did, particularly in the US macro one, we had Coors Banquet up at 19, a point that I'd probably go back to the bar for, well, it's just one point short of that. It was a decent enough beer. All the way down to seven for Miller Lite, one of the best selling light lagers in the US. But the whole idea of macro pilsner is that it's the same every time. And if Miller Lite always tastes like that, I'm baffled that it sells so, so well. The same with Michelob Ultra, Bush Light, Bud Light, Bush, all these beers down at the bottom were truly terrible. While up at the top, Cause Banquet, Pabs was a real surprise, not a bad beer. Boston Lager, which I thought would be decent or certainly have more flavor and more character than the other beers, even if there were flaws in there. Um, these were decent enough beers. So there is a real range of quality. You know, Don't just think that if you're having a macro beer, it's gonna be crap or if you're having your favorite macro beer, it's gonna be good because you might need to have a little look at either the variants or just the quality of them and see if there's something better out there. So no, we don't have to respect the macros for always brewing consistent beer because as far as I can tell, they don't. So something I've kind of failed to get across in these blind taste tests and have been pointed out again and again and again and again and again and again in the comments, particularly with the very first one that I did, which is, you know, bad macro beers, you know, are bad macro beers as bad as we think they are, um, is that it really does depend where those beers are actually being brewed. Obviously, lots of the beer that I get in the UK is brewed here, even if it is Stella, Madri, Heineken, Carlsberg, all that kind of stuff. You know, they have factories, they have contracts, in particular, at other breweries uh, to brew these beers, and they might be not doing it as well. Um, we have had so many comments from people going, like, oh, you're just drinking the foreign 
foreign or contract muck, not the original beers. And I have definitely had better experiences with, say, uh, Stella in Belgium. Um, or Cronenberg in France, which, yeah, one of the lowest scores, Cronenberg 1664. Um, but again, I mean, this points to the idea that not all macro beers are born equal, and certainly they're not even equal across the same brand in different nations, you know? So we need to treat macro beer with the same suspicion that lots of people do when they talk about, like, the roulette of craft beer. It's not that much better in the macro space. So another really common comment that we got across pretty much all of the blind taste tests was from people that didn't quite understand the scoring process that I had. And I'll admit, it was confusing. In fact, in the first video, I said I was going to rate, uh, <laughs> rate aftertaste out of 5 and then probably rated it out of 10. I can see why you might be confused by that. But what I was doing uh, in terms of my technique, in terms of how I appraise these beers, was kind of doing a middle ground between what you might do at home, which is basically, do I like this beer? And what we do when we judge professionally, and I've done that all over the world now, uh, which is judging to style. So judging to style means you don't just go, is this a great beer? Are there no flaws? Is it delicious? You also go, is this uh, representative of the style that the brewery claim it is meant to be? And obviously that's not objective is it's us attempting to be objective about these beers but that's still not objective because lots of people have different opinions on what the style should be and however much you rely on the bjcp guidelines they're quite fundamentally flawed in many styles it is the americans view of what british and german and belgian styles should be and a lot of the time i find those wildly inaccurate both historically and in modern terms and that is what people are judging these beers against well and that did confuse some people so in particular corona got a better score than it would if I was being a professional judge because there was something weirdly delicious about it like the umami naughty you know some some smells are quite unattractive but kind of addictive and that's what I got from Corona so I was like well I'm quite enjoying this but equally it doesn't taste anything like a light lager should and so it got slightly higher scores than beers that were less flawed but just not as interesting and delicious really so what I've learned from that and I kind of knew this already before from doing professional judging is that judging blind and judging particularly by style is not actually that helpful because yes it tells you perhaps how close it is to an American's ideal of what a British IPA is but it's not telling you whether that beer is delicious because we'll mark it down you know classic example uh, Harvey's which did very well in my blind, blind taste test typically would perform very poorly in professional judging because it has almost like kind of hints of diastole probably a little hints of of kind of green apple but also that's all mingled in with like real doughiness and raisins and lovely hoppiness um from loads of english hops so it's got all these beautiful character but it's also got what would be perceived as a flaw by a professional beer judge the long and short of it is though for you in terms of a takeaway is that you shouldn't just look at what beers are winning awards. For a start, small breweries in particular, because there's so many awards around, win lots of awards, even if they're not a very good brewery. Uh, but B, they will have been judged to style, right? And you might not agree with those style guidelines. So awards are only helpful to a point. My blind taste tests are only helpful to a point because of that subjective element, both when you're professional and when you're just drinking at home. Something I only really took on while I was digging back through these numbers is just the sheer incredible diversity of flavour that we can get from beer. Looking through all the things that I've written, there's so, so many different words being used, particularly in the IPA one, which is a style that everyone says, oh, it tastes the same. But I've got peach, coconut, uh, citrus, I've got um, tropical, I've got piney, I've got stone fruits, sticky fruits, tangerines, I've got Reef as in the, the orangey, horrible, um, pre-mixed alcoholic drink uh, for Tiny Rebel Club Tropicana. I've got Marshmallow. I've got Sherbet. I've got Dayak, Skunk, Caramel and Despair. Oh dear, Green King. The, the sheer diversity that we have within beer is just absolutely mind-boggling. And, you know, that's why in 14 years of being a beer lover, I have not got bored of it because there's always something new to find even within the style guides and I think we need to remember that when we're criticizing styles for tasting the same or brews for tasting the same nobody says that about you know the Bordeaux Bordeaux winemakers you know they have their ingredients they make beautiful stuff it all tastes within a certain bell curve and beer has a bell curve as well and IPA has a bell curve but ours is incredibly wide because of the diversity of flavor the incredible amount of essential oils aromatic compounds um, diversity of process, of location, um, all these things that feed into beer just means that one beer 
even the same beer made in the same brewery on a different day will taste subtly different. And that is one of my favorite things about beer. On a similar note, another thing I learned in this blind taste test is that all Spanish lagers taste like rhubarb and custard. Now that's definitely not a good thing, but outliers like that, or like the Tooth and Claw beer, or like Green King East Coast IPA, they do a really important role in beer, not just reminding us that we can have it so good compared to those, but also um, that we've often made up our minds before we have a drink. And that was definitely something that I'd done when it come, came to these blind taste tests. And it was a it was a bias that I was already aware of and why I did that original blind taste test about is bad macro beer actually that bad. But something I've learned is that removing that expectation can yield some really, really surprising results. So we had Beamish perform incredibly well in Best Bitters. We had London Pride perform incredibly well. We had Vocation perform incredibly well. Of course, Banquet absolutely blew my mind. I did not expect any beer to get 19 um, from the US macro episode. And I still have the can somewhere here because it surprised me so much. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. It's next to my um, Beer Writer of the Year 2022 award. Both important important canisters in my life, apparently. Then sometimes, sometimes cliches are true for a reason. So when we did our fest beer one, I did English fest beers and I slipped in a German one uh, to catch me out to make sure I was being honest. And that one won. Uh, it was clearly the best and that was Paul Arner's. Uh, but Thornbridge, Braybrook and Duration did great ones um, as well within there. And then, you know, Pilsner Rocale winning, it's my favorite lager um, in the world. I recognized it immediately. That clearly, that clearly uh, influenced my, um, my decision. But then of course we've got the famous one where we had to go back and that was, um, that was Castile coming joint top of our triple blind taste test, which really surprised me because I'd sort of written Castile off and I think a lot of Belgians has of being sort of brewed to be very sweet, not very complex to appeal to a mass crowd. Um, but I thought it was brilliant in that taste test and I went back once I knew what it was and thought it was brilliant again. When we tried it again, we were less sure. This feels like it's been filtered to within an inch of its life. Which I mean, is why it might be so clear. It certainly appears that way, doesn't it? Um, which could be, you know, that bias creeping back in, or it could be that when you're doing a blind taste test and your palate's a bit blown from having, how many did I have? I had 16 triples that day. Maybe my palate was just, you know, blind and something that was really sweet, you know, really jumped through. And the tasting notes were, you know, vanilla, ban banana ice cream. <laughs> You know, these really sweet, trashy kind of flavours and maybe that cut through. But yeah, so when we try to appraise a beer, when we come up a beer against a beer for the first time, we should definitely try to remove expectation from our minds. Uh, or even, I mean, this is very nerdy, but get somebody else to choose your beer for you and don't tell you what it is when you ask for one from the fridge. Just to give it a go, just to see if your expectations will be met. Uh, in retrospect, if you didn't know what it was at the time, because I've had some really surprising results through not knowing what I'm drinking. So I've alluded to this a couple of times in many different ways, but something that was really surprising was that supermarket IPA episode in which we had uh, 11 beers that I would go back to the bar for again. So 11 beers that I consider good enough to be like, yes, please give me that again. And that was a real surprise because ambient stored, and I, pr I think all of these were ambient stored, um, beers should not last that long. And I was checking the dates afterwards. A couple of them were two or three months old, but no more than that. So they were getting decent enough turnover, but they're still sat on those warm shelves, which means that breweries that are supplying supermarkets have got very, very good at brewing shelf stable beer. Maybe supermarkets are looking after craft beer a little bit better than they used to, but they're still not storing them in the fridges and they can be on those shelves um, for, a, for a good long while. So yes, yeah, supermarket IPAs are much better than I thought they were gonna be. They may be brewed to a price point, although I've never really bought into that argument. Often they're brands that have been around for a long time. Um, but they are being looked after, they are being shelf stable, and that presents a bit of an issue uh, to sort of the pr very premium end of the craft beer market, those that refuse to go into supermarkets. You can get great beer in a supermarket, and I hesitate to say that because I want to support indies, but in this current world that we're living in, uh, lots of people are having to shop and buy their beer in supermarkets. So the penultimate lesson that I learned was a trap that was set for me during, uh, during the Nitro Stout episode, which was when a Brew York pastry stout was slipped into the lineup, uh, I don't know, to trip me up, to ruin my palate, I don't know. But it was, it was their barrel-aged Empress Tonkoko, so a Tonkoko stout uh, that had been barrel-aged in, I think, rum barrels, maybe? And I loved the beer, and I gave it 23. 
uh, which was higher than all of, you know, it was higher than this one, which technically won the tasting along with Antipatch and Hob Days. Um, and what it showed to me, and you can also see it in some of the other episodes, such as the banana, <laughs> was it banana ice cream of, of the Castile, um, and in the supermarket IPA, peachy, coconutty, thick, you know, these big, bold, intoxicating aromas are what we kind of look for a lot in craft beer. Certainly when I'm not drinking beautifully made Czech and German lagers, I'm looking to be blown away, right? Mostly. And I think that, you know, we as a scene and me, I guess I'm really talking about me, I can't speak for other people. We're looking for big, bold, exciting flavors and experiences, something we'll remember for a long time, something we'll tell our friends about, something we'll make videos about. And that's something I need to remember and I guess keep in check, remember when I'm doing these tastings that I'm going to be wowed by the bigger flavours, particularly when my palate's tired and I'm getting excited and my cheeks are getting a bit ruddy because I've, you know, had 10 beers already. Uh, but we all do it. Um, you know, you can see that effect on Untapped, on Rate Beer, on blogs, Instagrams, even stuff we write about on the channel, um, that we are looking for experiences more than we're looking for technical perfection. But yeah, it's something that I was surprised by in myself. I thought I was a very measured taster, but actually every time you shoved something that smelled of banana or ice cream under my nose, I was like, brilliant, 24. And there's just one last lesson that I wanted to impart on you. Um, and it's a YouTube-y one. It is the fact that these videos, these videos went viral for us, or a couple of them did. So between the three biggest, the three viral ones, uh, we've had 1.34 million views. We gained 11,300 subscribers and earned just over £6,000 in ad revenue. £6,000 across the three years that we've been doing this, not a great return, but that's YouTube advertising for a channel in, in our niche. Um, but that's still not to be sniffed at. That's still incredible and very important to us. But those 11,000 subs has been absolutely revelatory to us. Um, and going viral on YouTube has some serious benefits that I didn't expect it to have. We've always said on the Craft Beer channel, impact, not impressions. And by that, we mean we want to change people's minds. We want to get people excited. We want to make people, you know, book that flight to this place or go visit their local independent bottle shop or brewery or join our Patreon and get involved in our, um, our Discord forum and, and create a community. That's what we're in it for on YouTube. So I just want to say thank you to all of you for watching this video, but also all of our blind taste tests and all of what we do, because these, particularly those three videos, but the 10 blind taste tests as a whole, as a whole have, have changed the channel's fortunes. And more recently, when times have been really tough, sponsorship's been hard to find, you know, really helped keep us afloat and keep us engaged and keep us excited. Uh, so thank you. And with that said, I would love to hear what more blind taste tests you would love to see, whether there's more, you know, regional lagers you'd love us to taste from different nations, whether you want to see like a Weiss beer one, or I don't know, a Hype IPA one. We could collect a load and taste those blind. We've also had some ideas about maybe doing sort of hype train episodes where we see if a hype beer is worth it, but me not knowing what that brewery and that hype is for or what beers I'm about to try, which could be interesting to take that expectation away. Uh, so yeah, we're open to ideas, please, Put them in our in the comment section or in our Patreon forum or hit us up on social. Um, and until the next time that I lay out 15 beers, have no idea what they are, and get a little bit squiffy. Squiffy. Good Lord, what is it? The 50s? Uh, love and beer. <laughs>